At the edge of the Arctic Circle, the sun sets even as a new day begins. It is two in the morning. The midnight sun lights the sky. This is Alaska, the last frontier. Alaska is so big, it is really many states. From the emerald green fjords of the Inside Passage to the wind-blown cliffs of the Pribilof Islands in the Bering Sea. From Prudhoe Bay, high in the Arctic, where man fights the elements for oil, to the salmon-rich streams of the Alaska Peninsula. Alaska has 33,000 miles of shoreline. Three thousand lakes. And more than three thousand rivers. Alaska has dozens of active volcanoes and the tallest mountains on the continent. This state is so vast, if you could see a thousand square miles a day, after a year, you'd still have a lot of Alaska left to visit. Alaskans are as varied as the terrain. Roughly a half million people called the last frontier home. From Eskimos living in remote villages to the citizens of the state's largest city, from dairy farmers in the Matanuska Valley to hearty dog mushers of Alaska's interior, you'll find roughnecks and totem carvers, fishermen and bush pilots, even future mud wrestlers, all in a state so picturesque, words don't do it justice. A map of Alaska shows just how big the great land is. The state is one-fifth the size of the continental United States, with a total land area of over 586,000 square miles. Alaska is two and a half times the size of Texas, 120 times larger than Rhode Island. We'll visit several distinct regions in Alaska. Ketchikan, Sitka, Juneau, and Skagway enjoy the mild but rainy climate of the southeast. Anchorage, Alaska's largest city, is found in the south-central Gulf Coast region, along with Valdez, Seward, and the pristine waters of Prince William Sound. Moving along to the western coast, the Eskimo community, St. Michael and the Aleut village, St. Paul in the Pribilof Islands. High on Alaska's north slope, 250 miles above the Arctic Circle, Prudhoe Bay. In Alaska's interior, the state's second largest city, Fairbanks, and towering Mount McKinley. Its official name is Mount McKinley, but Athabascan Indians in Alaska's interior named this mountain Denali, which means the high one. Rising 20,320 feet above the sea, this granite rock is the tallest peak in North America. The vertical rise from the base of Denali to the summit is greater than any other mountain in the world. Athabascan legend tells a story of Denali's birth, of two powerful magicians battling over an Indian bride, of a mighty spear deflected upwards and upwards by giant waves turned to stone. Flying around the high one, you can imagine what a battle it must have been. It's as if you're watching creation.
The peaks which surround Denali are themselves taller than most others on the continent. But they are merely the setting for this crown jewel of America. Mount McKinley casts its shadow on a national park the size of Massachusetts. People come here from all over the world. If they're lucky, they'll glimpse the summit. It takes luck because the mountain is often shrouded with a veil of clouds. Denali Park awakens in late May after eight months of winter slumber. Then, this subarctic wilderness springs to life in the long daylight hours of summer. The beauty and wildlife abound. Nomadic caribou are constantly on the move on the untamed Denali tundra. Theirs is a restless search for food. If they were to linger, the land would be overgrazed. So they roam, crossing thousands of square miles, sometimes flirting with danger. The grizzly will not give chase. He knows he's not fast enough to catch a healthy caribou. The chance to see so many animals makes this national park the most popular in Alaska. Often you'll find doll sheep on the high ridges both above and below the park road. The ewes with their young band together, apart from the rams in nursery groups. It is here that they learn to become expert climbers. They find safety in the rocky cliffs, knowing they are vulnerable in the flatland. The creatures of Denali Park fall into two groups, predator or prey. Preparing for winter from the largest grizzly to the smallest ground squirrel is a round-the-clock job except perhaps when it's playtime in the spruce forest. It's touching to watch this mother care for her children, knowing that if attacked by a grizzly, she can save only one. While the park and the mountain are spectacular, they only accentuate the vast beauty of this great land. In geologic terms, it's a land in its infancy, still being carved by the forces of nature. High in the mountains of south central Alaska, alpine meadows fill with snow that under immense pressure turns to ice. Here there is only one season. This is where glaciers are born. The 300-square-mile Harding Ice Field on the Kenai Peninsula spills into alpine valleys feeding more than 36 glaciers of the Kenai Fjords National Park. They dominate this park and offer a view of nature's grandeur seldom seen. Approaching these massive rivers of ice from the air, you look deep into crevasses which could hide most of Alaska's tallest buildings. The pinnacles of ice are as tall as skyscrapers. No words can truly describe this scene in nature and the drama which unfolds below.
the glaciers all have their own signatures. Stress marks and cracks formed as they move over rock buried for centuries. From the air, they look like highways to heaven. Because of a warming trend in the Earth's climate, most of these glaciers are in recession, melting back into the mountains of their birth. Drop by drop, piece by piece, they are getting smaller. Glistening icebergs clogged the water of Prince William Sound at the face of Columbia Glacier. Some of these bergs are at least four times larger than the cruise boats which make daily trips to Columbia Bay. Columbia is the largest tidewater glacier in Prince William Sound. It is more than 40 miles long and four miles wide at its face. But the glacier is rapidly receding. Scientists estimate that over the next few decades, Columbia may retreat as much as 20 miles. Because of all the ice calving from Columbia Glacier, the tour boats or cruise ships are no longer able to get closer than two and a half to three miles from the face. Still, even from a distance, Columbia Glacier is a sight to behold. Other glaciers, like Portage Glacier near Anchorage, calve their children into lakes. Decades ago, these icebergs were but fallen snow. Now, they are majestic models of the retreating glacier. Portage Glacier is Alaska's most visited attraction. Over 600,000 people visit Portage each year. Most step off motor coaches to view the collage of icebergs grounded in Portage Lake. It is a fascinating scene of icy blue bergs released by the glacier, which now is three miles away. During the summer, you can cruise to the face of Portage Glacier for an up-close look at this imposing river of ice. As glaciers retreat, they expose rock, which has been covered perhaps since the last ice age. The land, freed from its long winter slumber, is ready to be reborn. Brilliant dwarf fireweed are among the first plants to color the land. This rock, recently silent, is now a rookery for kittiwakes. Their cries are an anthem of new creation. The waters off Alaska's coast are teeming with life. Frolicking porpoise race any boat which enters their playground. A cruise from Seward to the Kenai Fjords is a wildlife odyssey. Leaving the Seward Harbor, you're first met by sea otters playing in Resurrection Bay. and orca whales also frequent these waters. Cruising the coastline, you'll marvel at the scenic beauty and varied sea life. On the rocks of the Chiswell Islands, a chorus of noisy sea lions. These islands are also rookeries for thousands of seabirds. Millions of salmon migrate through Alaska's waters. Their thousand mile journey to the high seas will end in the streams of their birth. The salmon's life is over, but they've spawned the seeds of another generation. So in death, 
they've assured that the life cycle will continue. When they can, Alaska's brown bears love to feast on salmon. And there's no better fishing hole than at the McNeil River State Game Sanctuary. Located on the Alaska Peninsula, McNeil River is unique on the globe. Every summer, over a hundred brown bears come to McNeil River to fish. And while the bears eat, a handful of humans are given permits to stand next to the river and watch. As many as 60 bears will show up at the falls at one time for a belly full of fresh salmon. It's the largest concentration of brown bears anywhere in the world. Normally solitary creatures, the bears cast aside their territorial instincts to fish side by side in this river. They are fascinating and sometimes funny to watch. Here, little sister just wants a bite of Big Brother's lunch. But he wants it all. The bears all have their own techniques for nabbing the big one. Some work better than others. It has to be frustrating to see all those salmon just out of reach. While the triplets look on, mom decides to give it one more try. The more patient types stand in the falls and wait for dinner to come to them. It usually works. Compare the fishing technique of this giant of the land to the giants of the sea. Throughout coastal Alaska, these great creatures glide through the waters. At the mouth of Glacier Bay, a pod of humpback whales fills the morning air with their mist. As they feed, they perform a graceful ballet. These humpback whales migrate to Alaska each summer from their wintering grounds in Hawaii or Baja California. In a single day, a humpback whale can eat a ton of food. Humpback whales average 40 to 50 feet long and weigh up to 80,000 pounds. Their impressive fluke is usually 10 to 15 feet wide. Humpback whales are often seen laying near the surface, waving their massive flippers.
The pectoral fins on most adult humpbacks are 13 feet long. When they slap them against the water, it makes a big splash. This behavior of the humpback whale is curious. Researchers believe it is not an act of aggression. Rather, the whale might simply be playing or inviting courtship. Southeastern Alaska is a thin ribbon of deep fjords, islands, and mountains rising from the sea. It's called the Panhandle. It's also called the Banana Belt because the climate here is much milder than the rest of Alaska. Archaeologists believe this coastal land was first inhabited after the last Great Ice Age, at least 10,000 years ago. Today, it is home to three native cultures, the Clinkets, Haidas, and Simsians. When Russian explorers first set foot on this land in 1741, they encountered a rich Clinket culture. Today, visitors to the totem parks in Sitka and Ketchikan can take a walk back in time. Towering monuments in cedar still stand in the forests, reconstructed from poles that have since deteriorated. Some totems tell stories. Others are carved in honor of an individual. Still others, like the Seward totem at Saxman, were likely carved to poke fun. The village of Saxman, three miles south of Ketchikan, is home to the world's largest collection of authentic totems. In the 1930s, two dozen totems from scattered villages in the region were brought to Saxman. Over the years, some have been restored or replaced with replicas. The art of totem carving is still kept alive by artists such as Nathan Jackson. For Nathan, Carving totems is both a way to earn a living and preserve his heritage. Well, I think it's the only thing that's left. To see the Tlingit language, for instance, is kind of fragmented. In fact, people don't do business that way anymore. And the only thing that we could leave as far as identification and those type of things or hallmark is a totem pole. The sun rarely shines in this neck of the woods. But when it does, Ketchikan is glorious. This island community built on stilts is one of the wettest places on Earth, with an annual rainfall of nearly 13 feet. It rains almost 200 days out of the year. The rain feeds the lush Tongass National Forest, the forest provides the cedar and spruce for Ketchikan's timber industry. The creeks are spawning grounds for a rich salmon fishery. Even Ketchikan Creek, below the former red light district, is still an active spawning stream. This part of Ketchikan was infamous. The brothels and dance halls of Creek Street were familiar to lusty fishermen from up and down the coast. Today, the buildings along the historic boardwalks are home to gift shops and restaurants. Ketchikan was once known as the salmon capital of the world. Throughout the fishing season, the silvery cargo is unloaded right at the dock. In a good year, uh, we'd have 50 million salmon. And uh, considering there's only 400 some thousand people in Alaska, that's a lot of salmon. And uh, in, in that kind of year, everything's hopping. Every cannery's running seven days a week, 24 hours a day, and they can't hire enough people to keep busy. And uh, in a good year, uh, a saner, after he catches 100,000 fish, he puts a broom in his mast. And uh, in a good year, he might put up three brooms. In fact, one guy put up a vacuum cleaner. In the summer, the harbor bustles with activity, and it's not just fishing boats. Stately cruise ships line the docks, and float planes come and go from the waterfront. There are two ways to see Alaska's panhandle, by plane or boat. Whether in the large ocean-going liners or a little closer to the water.
Southeast Alaska is a wilderness of acrobatic salmon and paintings on the still water, of endless waves lapping the shore, of solitude. It's home to Alaska's state capital. Stuck between a rock and the water by necessity, Juneau climbs up the hills. It is a picturesque capital built at the foot of Mount Juneau. During the summer, hardly a day passes without a cruise ship anchored in Gastineau Channel. Juneau is named after the prospector who discovered gold here in 1880. Today, Franklin Street, with its false-fronted buildings and frontier atmosphere, retains the gold rush flavor. Juno's many attractions include the onion-domed St. Nicholas Russian Orthodox Church, the Capitol Building with its marble pillars, and the governor's mansion built in 1912. Juno also has its very own drive-up glacier, just 13 miles from downtown. The Mendenhall Glacier flows 12 miles out of the coast mountains, ending in the fresh water of Mendenhall Lake. Deep blue ice is exposed by recent calving of the glacier. The ice at the terminus of the glacier fell as snow 200 years ago. Like most of Alaska's glaciers, the Mendenhall is receding. It is losing an estimated 30 to 70 feet of ice per year. Over a half million people visit Mendenhall Glacier each year. They see a grand display of the beauty and power of Mother Nature. Many visitors see the glacier from a different perspective, by helicopter. Helitours even land on the glacier. These tourists can brag that they walked on the Mendenhall. The influx of summer visitors to southeast Alaska is reminiscent of the gold rush of 1898, when thousands of gold-hungry prospectors flocked to the Klondike. Most made their way to Skagway at the northern end of Lynn Canal. All summer long, cruise ships tie up to the dock where Stampeders once began their journey. Just about all of Skagway is a living museum. Downtown looks much like it did at the turn of the century. The steam engine of the White Pass and Yukon Railroad still puffs through town, starting passengers on a ride to the summit of White Pass. This narrow gauge railroad follows the same route once used by prospectors. Past Inspiration Point and Dead Horse Gulch, en route to the summit at White Pass. Parts of the original trail of 98 are still visible. As the engine pulls its cargo from sea level to 3,000 feet, the Alaska wilderness unfolds below. On the outer coast of the Panhandle, Sitka Sound. In the distance, Mount Edgecombe. The mountains here catch the rains of each new storm. The forests are painted with a light green brush and carpeted with moss. It is here that you'll find Southeast Alaska's oldest city, Sitka, a town older than San Francisco. One can use many adjectives to describe Sitka. Charming, historic, thriving, scenic. The community is home for two of the hardiest breeds of Alaskans, fishermen and loggers. Each summer, the loggers compete to see who can throw, chop, and saw the best and have the most fun doing it.
This is a traditional show that sort of brings back the traditional logging, the, the way it was in the beginning, back in the early days when, before the power saws. We used hand saws, hand axes, and it's just a, a way of keeping alive the, the traditional history and, and a way of life that is still out there in the woods, but with a little more technology. Yeah, it was. You know, I'm their coach, coach and they had better one or they don't get any pickled herring. <laughs> <laughs> Sitka was founded by Russian fur traders. The Russian heritage is evident in the skyline of downtown, the spires of St. Michael's Cathedral, the replica of the old Russian fort. It was here that the Russians turned over Alaska to the United States in 1867 for $7.2 million. Sitka's Russian heritage is celebrated today by the new Archangel Dancers. The Russian influence is still felt far and wide in Alaska, mostly in the native villages and in the Russian Orthodox Church. The Russian Orthodox Church at St. Paul in the Pribilof Islands rests in the center of the community. It is much like others in Alaska. Inside, the sweet smell of incense wafts through the holy sanctuary. Sacred icons from the motherland adorn the walls. These icons are constant reminders of the church's past and its living present. These islands in the Bering Sea between Alaska and the Soviet Union are the breeding grounds for more than two-thirds of the world's population of northern fur seals. The fur seals begin arriving in May or early June and stay until November. 800 to 900,000 seals will crowd the rookeries of St. Paul and St. George Islands. The big males, called beach masters, arrive first to stake out their territory. These bulls weigh in at up to 600 pounds. They will aggressively stand guard over their herons. For up to two months, they'll fend off intruders without even leaving to eat. During this time, they will lose up to 25% of their body weight. The pups are born within two days after their mothers arrive on these rocky shores. An estimated 200,000 pups are born each year. The newborns weigh 10 to 12 pounds and will be nourished only by their mother's milk. The fur seal mother alternates between caring for her pup and feeding trips at sea. She may leave for up to two weeks at a time. While mom's away, the pups spend their time sleeping and playing. The Pribilof fur seals are no longer killed for their pelts. Although the islanders are allowed small numbers of young male seals for food. The Aleut people have not always lived on the Pribilofs. The Russian fur traders enslaved their ancestors, bringing them here from their homes in the Aleutian Islands. After generations of coexistence, islanders say seals and Aleut share a common bond and a common future. We have a saying amongst our people that the seals are like our cousins, they're our relatives. And so, like any other relatives that we have in our village, we have to take care of them as part of our extended family. And if the seals were to die off, I think uh, there could be a very real possibility our people would die off too. 
and vice versa. If our people died off, the fur seals would be in jeopardy. So there's a real symbiotic relationship between the two that's very close. The rocky cliffs of the Pribilofs attract millions of seabirds. Bird watchers come here from around the globe to witness the colorful and sometimes rare species. Parakeet auklets and tufted and horned puffins are among 200 species of birds nesting on these treeless islands, often referred to as the Galapagos Islands of the North. Above the bird cliffs, the Arctic fox lives close to his dinner. This is a unique and rich region between two great continents. The millions of birds and fur seals attest to the bounty of the Bering Sea. It feeds all, the animals and the people who came across the land bridge from Asia and settled the great land. The first Alaskans built their homes and villages close to the sea or in areas where game is plentiful. Today, Alaska's Indians, Aleuts, and Eskimos still live off the sea and land. St. Michael on the western coast is home for 200 Yupik Eskimos. Life here is typical of native villages. The villagers live in houses, not igloos. Communication is by satellite. Their lifestyle, however, is still largely based on subsistence hunting and fishing as it has been for thousands of years. In the summer, many families move to fish camps near St. Michael. Here, Lawrence and Irene Lockwood are drying silver salmon. Irene uses the traditional ulu to clean and prepare the fish. Over the course of the summer, they'll net and smoke 700 fish, enough to feed their family and their son's dog team all winter. Lawrence is speaking in Yupik, his native tongue. He's explaining that for him, this camp is the best place to spend the summer. Once in a while, I could see a moose up there. I got one here some time ago. Also got one walrus from that point over there, a big female. And also got a beluga whale in my net one time. A young one, so that's a little bit of everything here. This is a garden of plenty you'd expect to find at the end of the rainbow. A wilderness of great beauty, from north to south, east to west, and in all seasons. Alaska is a land of extremes. Prudhoe Bay on Alaska's north slope the largest oil field yet discovered in North America. It's located in one of the harshest environments, closer to the North Pole than it is to Seattle, Washington. You're looking at the frozen Arctic Ocean in May. For eight months, this area is blanketed with swirling snow and ice. In winter, the temperature will drop to 60 below. Caribou adapt to these conditions, and so do the men and women who work here. Well, the hardest part is to leave up here in winter and go home and have to mow the lawn. And, uh, but it's, it's a long, long cold period every year. It's probably like nowhere else on Earth. I've traveled a lot. My time off, that's what I usually do. And you can't compare it with anywhere else. It's flat and it's cold <laughs> most of the time. Prudhoe Bay produces 20% of America's domestic oil. In its first decade, the Trans-Alaska Pipeline carried more than 5 billion barrels of crude 800 miles from Prudhoe Bay to the port of Valdez. 
and it has carried Alaska's economy on a roller coaster ride. The shiny pipeline skirts the city of Fairbanks in Alaska's interior. Tourists come to walk in its shadow. Fairbanks grew like a giant Alaskan cabbage during and since construction of the Trans-Alaska Pipeline. Founded on the banks of the Chena River at the turn of the century, Fairbanks was a supply center for nearby gold mines. It is still a supply center, but the river boats which used to haul miners in and the gold out now haul passengers on a fascinating trip into Fairbanks' past. The riverboat Discovery is owned and operated by the Binkley family. Skip Binkley's grandfather first came to Alaska in 1898 with dreams of piloting sternwheelers on Alaskan rivers. Riverboating became a family tradition. Every day during the summer, the Discovery winds down the Chena River, passing homesteads and a dirt airstrip where bush pilots put on an aerial display. Where the Chena meets the murky Tananaw River, the current churns the silt from the river floor. Moving along the Tananaw River, the paddle wheeler passes Indian fish wheels turning in the swift current. The discovery also stops at an authentic Chena Indian village. There, Mary Shields, a well-known Alaskan musher, greets passengers with a lively sled dog demonstration. On shore, visitors are shown how the Athabascan Indians of Alaska's interior live off the land. The riverboat trip is one of Fairbanks' most popular attractions. Another well-liked stop is the historic Gold Dredge No. 8, where tours of the giant dredge are given. And if gold fever strikes, you can even pan for gold. The University of Alaska Museum is another popular stop on the city tour of Fairbanks, as are the university's botanical gardens. The 70,000 people who live in the Fairbanks area enjoy summers with temperatures in the 90s. But when the leaves fall from the trees and winter comes, the mercury can drop to 60 below. It's a great country if you like sled dog racing. Locals call Fairbanks the dog-mushing capital of the world. In March, Fairbanks hosts the North American World Championships. The best sprint dog mushers in the North line up their teams on 2nd Avenue for three exciting days of mushing. Snow may blanket the course, but the competition is hot. This is one of the last big races of the winter season. All along the course, Fairbanksons cheer on their favorite mushers and their dogs. Nice finish, Joey. Nice run. Winter in Fairbanks is also the best time for viewing the fabulous northern lights. The aurora borealis electrifies the northern sky with brilliant displays of color. Technically, you're watching the result of the collision between atoms and molecules and highly charged electrons in the upper atmosphere. The energy released in an average display of the northern lights is equivalent to one year's worth of energy consumed in the United States. Large events, such as this rare red aurora, have been known to cause power outages in major cities.
Alaska's largest city glitters at the foot of the Alaska Range and Mount McKinley. The Anchorage skyline reflects its cosmopolitan nature. Based at the foot of the Chugach Mountains, Anchorage is home for nearly a quarter million people, half the state's population. It is a banking center and transportation hub for much of Alaska. It has been said that what's nice about living in Anchorage is that you're only a float plane trip away from the real Alaska. But Anchorage, despite its rush hour traffic and hustle and bustle, is as Alaskan as they come. This urban setting offers scenic beauty. Wildlife in your front yard and access to nearby wilderness as wild and untamed as you'll find anywhere in Alaska. This is the Talachulitna River, a 35-minute flight from Anchorage. Guide Steve Johnson, owner of the Talaview Lodge, is taking his guests Will Bauer and Ian Batcha to the mouth of the Talachulitna. Today, they're fishing for king salmon. During the summer, as many as 10,000 king salmon move up this river to spawn. Catching a 40-pound yeah. king is yeah. a thrill any time. On a fly rod, it's a real challenge. Whoa. Certainly has a king salmon. This is dynamite. It's a nice big male. Lift him up there, Will. Take For Will, hooking the king turns out to be the easy part. Now the work he begins. He's not very happy about it, is he? He's not liking that. Pretty healthy fish, though. I know. Well, that might be a female. Think so? With the prize Pretty next to the boat, Steve oh, uses well, a salmon tailor to grab the fish so? without hurting it. Oh. Now you can see how yes. big these kings are. One nice this female. one will measure nearly 42 inches. For fishermen around the world, fishing in Alaska can't be beat. And if you're fishing in South Central Alaska, you can be back in Anchorage in under an hour. Anchorage lies along Cook Inlet, named for the British sea captain James Cook. He and explorers who followed him sailed here in search of the Northwest Passage, but were turned away once and then a second time by the shallow waters and mudflats. They named the inlet Turnagain Arm. Today, sailors of a different sort ply the chilling water. These adventurers shared the wind with eagles. At low tide, the eagles compete for candlefish, while on shore, a handful of dip netters do the same. Alaska has long had a spell on those who visit and those who call Alaska home. It's what makes men and women run up Marathon Mountain and despite the toil and trouble, swear they have fun doing it. Some people go to Hawaii, some people run mountains for fun. That's what this is. This is fun? You gotta love it. I was talked into it last year and couldn't back out of it this year. I'm just glad it's over. Great run, great time. Very hard, but fun. In Alaska, the paraders march, whether in sun, rain, or winter snow. And no matter when the sun sets, fireworks will light the 4th of July skies. In March, Alaska's spell captures Iditarod mushers like Jerry Austin. They'll take their dog teams over a thousand miles, crossing mountain ranges and battling fierce storms year after year after year. Alaska casts its spell on Kathy Hinkle, 
who can fillet a 100-pound halibut in one minute. Alaska casts its spell on Jean King of Homer. During the winter, she's fed and cared for hundreds of bald eagles in her spare time. Alaska has so much to offer anyone who's willing to take it. It is a wilderness beyond the wildest imagination, just waiting to be explored. Alaska, a permanent frontier for America's spirit.